Hello, and welcome to The Space Above Us. Episode 72, Space Shuttle Flight 5, STS-5. Open for business. Before we get started, I have yet another minor correction. This slip-up is pretty inconsequential, but as someone who really likes to dig into obscure space trivia, I just couldn't let it stand uncorrected. On the STS-4 episode, I mentioned how John Young and Ken Mattingly were the only two people to fly a Saturn V and fly in a space shuttle. That's mostly true, but while writing some trivia for a contest at work, I realized that it needed a bit of an asterisk. That's because Fred Hayes flew on a Saturn V for Apollo 13 and flew in Enterprise during the approach and landing tests. Enterprise may have never flown in space, but good ol' OV-101 is still a space shuttle, so Hayes makes the list. Though we can still safely say that Young and Mattingly are the only two people to launch in a Saturn V and launch in a space shuttle. Anyway, let the record stand corrected. Last time, we talked about STS-4, which marked the end of a short but important era in the history of the space shuttle. That's because STS-4 was the last of the orbital test flights. During these flights, the space shuttle was still considered to be an experimental vehicle, resulting in small crews who wore pressure suits while sitting in ejection seats. And while the payload bay still had plenty of interesting equipment, it was mostly there to help study the orbiter itself. So, I hear you asking, what's so different about the operational flights? Well, a bunch of things, but we'll look at a few. First, crew size. For the first time, the new type of astronauts, mission specialists, would be flying aboard the shuttle, bringing the STS-5 crew size up to four. The orbital test flights were kept down to the commander and the pilot since their jobs involved getting the orbiter up to space, back to Earth, and keeping it functioning in between. Future commander and pilot roles would have a similar focus, allowing the mission specialists to tend to onboard experiments and payloads. This division of labor would continue for the life of the shuttle program. Next, the ejection seats. Columbia was outfitted with two fairly bulky ejection seats in the front of the flight deck for use by the commander and pilot. Adding an ejection seat for each crew member would have been impractical, especially for anyone sitting down below on the mid-deck. And as discussed previously, the window where the seats could be activated was actually pretty small, but it added some measure of safety or at least made everyone feel better about the early risky missions. So with their somewhat dubious utility and impossibility of seats for the whole crew, they had to go. Besides, with the operational phase beginning, the thought was that they were no longer necessary anyway. The whole point was that by now, the shuttle was a well-understood vehicle that didn't need ejection seats any more than a 747 would. In the future, these ejection seats would be removed entirely, but since that was a fairly involved operation and would impact the schedule, for now they would simply be deactivated. Interestingly, the two mission specialists for STS-5, who would not have ejection seats, advocated for keeping the seats operational. Their thought being that if the worst case scenario happened, it would be better to recover half of the crew than none of it. But the commander and pilot, who would have ejection seats, squashed that idea. If they were going down, they are going to go down as a crew. They didn't like the idea of surviving an accident only by abandoning their crewmates. And I thought it was kind of interesting how the arguments were sort of backwards of what you might initially expect, but once you hear both sides, it made sense. One more critical change that accompanied the start of operational flights was the end of the practice of launching and re-entering in pressurized spacesuits. For the first time in NASA's history, the crew would launch wearing helmets and fabric flight suits. While crews on occasion had landed in their regular flight suits, they had always launched fully kitted out with a pressurized suit in case of a sudden cabin depressurization. But part of the promise of the space shuttle was a shirt sleeve environment. I know I sort of overused this comparison, but you wouldn't expect the crew of a 747 to show up wearing space suits despite flying at high altitude. To give you an idea of just how sure the folks at NASA were about this suitless future, Joseph Schmidt, a technician who had helped suit up every astronaut since Alan Shepard way back on Freedom 7, retired after STS-4. After 21 years in the job, his pressure suit expertise was no longer required. <laughs> 
The decision to do away with pressurized suits would prove to have dire consequences 20 flights later on Challenger's final mission. The main highlight of the planned mission also reflected the shuttle's operational status, deploying two commercial spacecraft. The SBS-3 and ANIC C-3 communication satellites would be carried in Columbia's payload bay and deployed on the first and second day of the flight, respectively, before heading to geostationary orbit. Later on, we'll get a bit into the mechanics of the actual deployment, so for now, let's do a quick refresher on what geostationary orbit is and how these two satellites will get there from the shuttle, which was very much not in a geostationary orbit. Satellites that fly lower than around 1,500 kilometers are considered to be in a low Earth orbit. Just as a random example, and definitely with no favoritism from me, let's look at Landsat 7. Landsat 7 flies at about 700 kilometers above the Earth and takes just under 100 minutes to make its way around the planet. If we were to, oh, I don't know, send a servicing mission to Landsat 7 and slightly boost its orbit higher, it would take a little longer to make one lap around the world. The higher the orbit, the slower the satellite, and the longer the orbital period. If you were to keep going higher and higher, the orbital period would eventually hit 24 hours, the same amount of time that it takes for the Earth to rotate in one day. Well, close enough. I'm not going to get into sidereal days here. A satellite at such an altitude and directly above the equator would appear to remain stationary in the sky. This orbit is called a geostationary orbit, and it is super useful for a lot of applications. One most people are familiar with is satellite TV. If the satellite stays in one place, then you only have to point your home satellite dish once, as opposed to tracking it as it flies across the sky. The trouble here is that while the shuttle is flying at around 300 kilometers, geostationary orbit is at around 36,000 kilometers, so it's going to need a little help. Depending on the mission, that help can come in a number of different forms. But for today's flight, it is in the form of a PAM-D upper stage. The PAM-D, which stands for Payload Assist Module Delta Variant, was a small solid rocket motor used to boost spacecraft weighing up to about 1,300 kilograms out of low Earth orbit and into a geostationary transfer orbit. Geostationary transfer orbit, or GTO, is pretty much just what it sounds like. It's a temporary orbit that has its high point way up near geostationary orbit and its low point down near the Earth. Once in such an orbit, it's typically up to the spacecraft itself to circularize its orbit and settle into its final position. But by getting a free ride to GTO, the spacecraft can save a lot of fuel, which it needs to maintain its orbit over time. While there isn't any air at geostationary orbit, the effects of stuff like the moon, the sun, and even the lumpiness of the Earth gently works to pull geosatellites out of their position, necessitating the occasional small engine burn. The other major element of this mission was the first spacewalk of the shuttle era. This was a big deal for a number of reasons. While it wasn't originally a major focus, the shuttle program would come to require a lot of extravehicular activity, so it was important that the airlock, EVA support tools in the payload bay, and new spacesuits worked as expected. But this specific spacewalk also presented an opportunity to practice for the first satellite repair flight, which would attempt to fix the Solar Maximum mission a few flights down the road. In the back of the payload bay were a bunch of tools, along with stuff like thermal blankets, latches, cables, and so on, that they might encounter on future EVAs. It actually reminds me of Gemini 12, when Buzz Aldrin made his way to the back of the equipment module to essentially just play around with different tools and see how easy or hard they were to use in microgravity. We'll be talking a lot about EVA pretty soon, so I'm going to hold off on a detailed explanation of the fancy new shuttle-era spacesuits. Plus, it turns out that they may not be the most relevant to this particular mission after all. Flying this mission would be a crew of four marking the first time since 1975 that more than two astronauts flew at once, and the first time ever that a crew was larger than three. So I guess just squirrel that one away for space trivia night. Flying as commander for this mission would be someone who flew on that last three-person crew, Vance Brand, 
Brand joined NASA in 1966 as part of Astronaut Group 5 and served as the command module pilot for the Apollo-Soyuz test project back in 1975. Since we've got a bigger crew than usual to get through, if you want more details on Brand, I'll just refer you to episode 62, which covered the Apollo-Soyuz test project. This was his second of four flights. Joining Brand at the front of the flight deck and serving as pilot was Bob Overmeyer. Robert Overmeyer was born on July 14, 1936, in Lorraine, Ohio. Overmeyer earned a bachelor's degree in physics from Baldwin Wallace College and a master's degree in aeronautics from the U.S. Naval Postgraduate School. In between those two, he joined the U.S. Marine Corps, learned to fly, joined an attack squadron, and studied aeronautical engineering and maintenance. He joined up with the Manned Orbiting Laboratory Project in 1966, and I think we all know how that one ends. Overmeyer joined NASA in 1969 along with many of the other MOL astronauts. Since then, he's been kicking around supporting everything from Apollo 17 to Skylab and the approach and landing tests. This is his first of two space flights. And for the first time, the commander and pilot would not be alone on their shuttle flight. That's because riding in the back of the flight deck and down on the mid-deck would be the first two mission specialists to fly. Mission Specialist 1, who would launch on the mid-deck and re-enter on the flight deck, was Joe Allen. Joseph Allen was born in Crawfordville, Indiana on June 27, 1937. And for the first time in a while, we've got someone who doesn't fit the stereotypical test pilot astronaut role. Instead, Allen held a PhD in physics from Yale University, which is a little bit different than the usual path of bouncing around various wings of the military and test pilot school. Allen joined NASA in 1967 as part of the second group of scientist astronauts. In the intervening 15 years, he served in a bunch of different roles, including the Apollo 15 support team and the STS-1 re-entry Capcom. As a mission specialist, his primary focus was on deploying the Annex C-3 satellite and evaluating the new spacesuit during an EVA. This is his first of two space flights. Mission Specialist 2, flying on the mid-deck during launch and the flight deck during re-entry, was Bill Lenore. William Lenore was born on March 14, 1939 in Miami, Florida. He attended the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, earning a bachelor's degree in electrical engineering. And I guess he enjoyed himself because he stayed on board at MIT for a master's and a PhD. He was teaching at MIT when he joined NASA as part of the second group of scientist astronauts alongside Joe Allen. We've actually briefly discussed Lenore already back on the first Skylab 3 episode. As you'll recall, Skylab 3 lost first one and then two RCS thruster quads, prompting a scramble for a potential rescue mission. If the rescue mission had happened, the crew would have been Lenore and, oh hey, look at that, Vance Brand. So I guess they flew together after all. This was Lenore's only spaceflight. On November 11th, 1982, the systems were ready, mission control was ready, and the crew was ready. The 40-minute launch window opened at 7.19 a.m., and Columbia lifted off right on schedule. No delays, postponements, or scrubs. For those keeping track at home, this is Columbia's fifth flight in a row, with an average of about 16 weeks between each launch. Eight minutes and 49 seconds after lifting off, Columbia was flying free, having jettisoned the SRBs and external tank. It was time to get to work. Just five hours after launch, it was time for another launch, this time from the back of the orbiter payload bay. The SBS-3 communications satellite holds the honor of being the first payload, commercial or otherwise, deployed from the shuttle, so I suppose we should learn a little about it. SBS-3 was owned by Space Business Systems, hence the SBS in its name, and was designed to provide digital voice, email, messaging, and other communication services. For a visual, it was basically just a big cylinder, 7 feet in diameter. I'm not sure how tall it was while in the payload bay, but once it was fully set up, it would be 21 feet tall. When deployed, it weighed 3,277 kilograms. Of that mass, 60% was the PAM-D motor that would deliver it to geostationary transfer orbit. 15% was another motor that would help SBS-3 circularize its orbit once at the proper altitude. 
14% was the actual SBS spacecraft itself, and 4% was the fuel to be used for station keeping. When I added that all up, I got about 220 kilograms of mystery mass, so I guess we brought E.T. home or something. Once deployed, SBS-3 would be pushed into its higher orbit by the PAM-D motor. But the PAM-D was more than just a solid rocket motor. In an effort to make the system as simple and self-contained as possible, it also contained a number of support elements. The overall structure was a 15-foot wide cradle holding the spacecraft and motor in the back of the payload bay. Surrounding it was a sun shield covered in thermal blankets that would open sort of like Pac-Man's mouth when it came time to deploy. Once the sun shield was open, the support structure would spin the spacecraft, slowly ramping up to between 45 and 100 rotations per minute. And when the time came, the crew would issue a command that severed the connection between the spacecraft and the cradle, allowing four large springs to gently push it away at about one meter per second, with the spin helping it to keep stable. The overall system was designed to be easy to install, easy to operate, and easy to reuse. Pretty neat. When the time came, Brand positioned Columbia belly forward, so that when SBS-3 was ejected, it would be kicked out behind the shuttle in its orbit. Bill Lenore activated the command to open the sun shield and spin the spacecraft up to 50 RPM. Finally, Lenore issued the launch command precisely on schedule, and SBS-3 gently flew away from Columbia. Before the signal to ignite the PAM-D was issued, Columbia was hopped about 16 miles away, and turned its belly towards the spacecraft. This maneuver was to protect sensitive instruments from any contamination that might come from the plume of the solid rocket motor. Given the number of literal and figurative moving parts, it's pretty impressive that the entire thing went off without a hitch on the first try. While I won't bother doing this for most payloads, I think the shuttle's first deployed payload deserves a little epilogue. In 1995, after 13 years of service, six years past its design life, SBS-3 was decommissioned and moved into a graveyard orbit above the geostationary ring. It's sort of tough to tell, but it seems that the spacecraft actually outlived the company that originally owned it. The next day, it was time to do it all over again. From what I can tell, the Annex C-3 satellite used the same spacecraft bus as SBS-3, meaning it had the same basic design but with different bells and whistles and a different customer. Owned by Telesat Canada, this commsat would focus on remote parts of Canada that were tricky to reach with traditional communications infrastructure. You might have an image of a communication satellite beaming its signal to the entire side of the planet visible from its geostationary perch, but that's not actually how it works. Rather than waste power beaming signals to wide swaths of empty ocean, Annex C-3 focused four beams down on Canada, covering most of the country. This is definitely out of my wheelhouse, but as I understand it, this saves on power, reduces the chance of radio interference with other satellites, and allows the signal to be stronger where it matters. And saving power was important. While having a solar panel in space basically gives you free electricity, you don't want to carry more mass than you need. So with that in mind, Annex C-3 operated on only about 1,100 watts of power, which really isn't all that much. For comparison, my gaming PC uses a 750-watt power supply, and my gaming PC is a lot less useful to Canada. So that's two days of the mission, and two major objectives accomplished. Next up on the third day was the extravehicular activity. Unfortunately, it had to be delayed 24 hours as half the crew fell victim to the dreaded space adaptation syndrome. And throwing up in a close helmet in microgravity is not only super duper gross, but also really dangerous. Extra unfortunately, when the crew finally did suit up on day 4, they hit a snag. See, there's a reason I didn't get into too much detail on this EVA. Both Alan and Lenore's suits encountered problems. Alan's suit problem was the somewhat less concerning of the two, at least that's how it seems to me, but it still likely would have scrubbed the spacewalk all on its own. The suit's circulation fan was not running smoothly. Instead, it made a sort of chugging noise described by the crew as sounding like a motorboat. The circulation fan was important on its own, but its struggles could indicate a more serious electrical problem. <laughs> 
Meanwhile, Lenore's suit was having trouble with its oxygen regulator, failing to come up to the proper pressure. Again, from what I can tell, this may have been acceptable on its own, but you simply don't take the risk of putting a person out into the vacuum of space with a suspect oxygen regulator. Add on the fact that both suits were having issues with their helmet-mounted lights, and that was the end of that. Both men were severely disappointed, but there was nothing that could be done. Just as one extra bit of space trivia, it seems there was a possibility that the problems with Alan's suit were manageable enough that he could maybe go out on his own. This would have been pretty remarkable since it would be the only solo EVA of the entire shuttle program. I've seen a couple of accounts of either Mission Commander Vance Brand or Joe Allen himself putting a stop to this idea, but in any case, it didn't happen. Just to bring up the mood a little bit after that bummer of a non-EVA, there was a fun story that caught my eye in the Johnson Space Center oral histories. Thanks again to David Hitt and Heather Smith for their excellent book, Bold They Rise, which makes it a lot easier to find good places to jump into the oral histories. It seems that, starting around now, NASA took a few extra precautions when it came to their cameras. Whether out of concern that astronauts would be on the wrong settings and miss something important, or simply waste time trying to figure out why the camera wasn't operating as expected, they made a few modifications to simply remove extraneous functionality. One bit of functionality deemed unnecessary was the delayed shutter button. But it seems mission specialist Joe Allen was determined to get a group photo and took it upon himself to acquire a small device that would push the shutter button on a delay. The device was carried in Allen's pocket as he boarded the shuttle, joining John Young's corned beef sandwich as one of more than a few items secretly smuggled into space by astronauts. As Allen tells it, when the folks running the photo lab saw the pictures of the four-man crew grouped together holding a sign reading, Satellite Deployment by Ace Moving Company, Fast and Courteous Service, We Deliver, they must have realized what the astronauts had done, but they never said a word. When the guy running the photo department retired years later, Alan presented him with the shutter device as thanks. The day after the failed EVA attempt, it was time to come home. Lenore and Alan took their seats out of storage and set them up on the flight deck and mid-deck, and Brand and Overmeyer prepared Columbia for the trip home. Five days, two hours, 14 minutes, and 1.85 million miles after lifting off, Columbia touched down at Edwards Air Force Base, having left 6,616 kilograms of spacecraft behind in orbit. As part of the landing, and presumably with an eye towards the lengthy maintenance period already planned for Columbia, Brand evaluated the maximum braking capability of the orbiter. As Brand put it, quote, We ruined the brakes, completely ruined them, but it was a test to see how well they would hold together if you did that. So, good job? Next time, Columbia gets a well-earned break, as OV-099 takes the spotlight. Space Shuttle Challenger will become the second orbiter to fly in space, and will deploy the first satellite in NASA's new Tracking and Data Relay Satellite System, or TDRS. The mission will also see the first EVA and, uh, first spacesuit leak of the shuttle program. Don't worry, it'll be fine. Probably. It'll probably be fine. <laughs> Ad Astra. Catch you on the next pass.